you'll be with us this evening and bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here this evening. Be with those that were not able to be here for whatever reason. Help them, Lord, and give them protection and help them through whatever they're facing. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless and anoint our praise and worship team as they come to do that that you've called them to do. And I pray that you'll bless our brother Gene as he brings the message tonight and may we receive it in the way that you would have us to. You heard the prayer request given in? We pray that you'll intervene in behalf of every one of them. Thank you for that praise report. Thank you for answering prayers, Lord. And we know that there's nothing too hard for you. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. We are so glad that you have came to worship with us. Amen. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. That's awesome. We're so glad you're here. I am the righteousness of God. I stand in covenant with him. And through this, I have new life, new anointing, and new power. I will not worry nor have fear. Lord, your word and your spirit, they come for me. I am increasing in your knowledge and in your wisdom. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Through your covenant, I am healthy. I am blessed. There is nothing missing and nothing broken. You have made me a blessing, and everything I touch is blessed. Lord, I thank you that my family walks in obedience to your word and to your will. Take me, Lord. Take Ridgeville Church of God to the highest place in glory. Amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? God, we thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name, God. We give you praise and honor tonight, God. Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you, God. We give you glory and honor, Father. God, we thank you for what you've done, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing, God. We thank you for your blessings, Lord. God, we give you praise and honor, God. We praise your holy name, Lord. We bless you, God. Lord, we bless you, Lord. We praise you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. For my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence i sing beneath the shadow of your wings oh better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere oh better is one day Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory. cry out for you the living God your spirit's water to my soul I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I would 
draw near to you. I will draw near to you. The better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Oh, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Oh, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Than thousands elsewhere. Good afternoon, church. God's so good, ain't he? Yeah, give him praise. You can. We're going to take about evening tithes and offerings. Um, pastor asked me to do it. He was said if he wasn't here in time to do it for him. So uh, I know the pastor and the first lady is very thankful for any part of the church when they need something because they can't be here at that moment that they can call on each one of us, no matter what it is, that we can fill in for them. Um, I think the pastor and the first lady deserves to be... Um, with their child when he's in special events and he done an amazing job we went there to see him we didn't catch the last song but uh he did well with the first one we seen him in um god's on the move he's on a move and he's in the healing business sister patricia he's in the healing business your grandbaby can be healed of that whatever that's going on with his eyes and ears he's an awesome god brother we know what tomorrow not holds, but he knows what tomorrow holds. And if he said, if he should come back tonight, we, as the pastor said, this, this thinks a lot of things, but this has to be ready, amen. But in our offering, Galatians 6, uh, 7, 10 says, giving tithes and offerings with hope for our, for how God will use it is sowing to the spirit and this hopeful giving empowers the church collectively show the spirit as it does good when you give the Bible plainly states give and it shall be given back to you how many times press down and shaken up amen God is so good to us if he doesn't bless us with anything else we can never repay him for what he's already done for that we can never repay him we can't do it but the heart given. He knows the very thoughts of our heart. He knows the love of our hearts for him. Amen. So give tonight as, as God leads you to give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for everything that's been accomplished this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, God, that you're so good to us. And Lord, that you are sufficient to our soul, Lord, that you are the love of us, O oh God. And we thank you for everything that has been accomplished through the blood of the Lamb tonight, God. We thank you that you're going to bless each and every one tonight in the given. We know that you're going to use it for the building of your kingdom, God. Not only in this, the four uh, corners of this church, but outside the walls of this church, God, that you're going to use it for the building of your kingdom to reach lost souls, Father. And we just want to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor for everything that you have done and going to do. And we give you, we give you grace and we just give it all to you, Father, that you are the grace and our lives, Father, we thank you for that this day. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. As I should serve you tonight.
soul and worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name your rich in love and your soul to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name and on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship Your holy. Day and night, night and day, let it 
sins arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense sins arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense sins arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense sins arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense sins arise. everything that we can give him everything we have is owed to him the breath we have in our body the sight that we have in our eyes the feelings we have in our fingers everything we have is because of him he's worthy of it all I don't know what that means to you tonight. But to me, that means he's worthy of everything that I can give him. Right down to the very fact of possibly having to lay down my life for his name's sake. Are we here tonight just singing those words? We were talking about it this morning. Sunday night service used to be the service that everybody wanted to come to. It was the cream of the crop. You came because you knew something was going to happen. You knew if God was going to show up, He was going to show up in the house on Sunday nights because we came looking for Him. We came ready to worship Him. We came ready to praise Him and honor Him. And I begin to ask myself the question, what has happened in our Sunday night services? Where has God gone in our Sunday night services? And he simply has answered, I didn't move. I didn't walk out of the church. I've not left where I have been from the beginning of time. But my people have got to the point where they come to church to check off a box. I did what I had to do. I did what everybody says I'm supposed to do. I came. We sang three songs. I listened to a sermon. We prayed. We may have went to the altars. We may not have went to the altars. If we experience God, good. If we don't, we'll try again next Sunday. Where? has the tenacity of the church gone to chase after God no matter what it takes no matter if we're here till midnight waiting on him to show up no matter if we have to roll in the altars if we have to cry our eyes out if our makeup runs if our hairpins fall out where has it gone try to answer that question for us tonight y'all pray for me tonight as I, I preach this message two weeks ago the pastor asked me to preach tonight actually it was three weeks ago and I begin to want I begin to ponder on what God would have me to say and then the pastor preached two Sundays ago he preached on our failure is not final and I'm not going to reiterate his word. 
And if the praise team wants to sit down tonight, that is fine, because I'm going to get to my scripture in just a few minutes. And if the church wants to sit down, that's fine as well. Follow with me for just a few minutes. And all that I have to say will culminate together to come down to my point tonight for the last three minutes of what I have to say to answer that question. The pastor preached on our failure is not final. Your failures in life does not have to be your final moments. But so often in times, the devil gets us to that point and he whispers in our ear, you can't overcome that. God can't use you again. God will never use you like he used to. God will never speak through you. God will never work through you. And as long as we allow him to continue to lie to us like that, he's telling the truth. Now, my Bible tells me, and I'm sure we're all reading from the same scripture, but that the devil himself is the father of All lies. No truth can come from his mouth. So when he's speaking those things to you, don't believe him. When he's speaking those lies in your ear, you do not have to believe him. But the problem is he speaks them in such a way that he then makes us begin to tell ourselves, what he is telling us, and it rolls over and over and over, and eventually the devil's not telling us anything. We're telling ourself, and we've got ourselves in a cycle, and we're stuck in a rut and cannot get out of it. Our failure does not have to be our final destination. He talked about Peter The same one who answered him when he asked them, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the son of God. You are the most high. Who then just verses of scripture later denied him in front of all men. And if Peter would have stayed there, the church that we know it as today may not have been born. Now, I am a firm believer that if I fail at what God calls me to do, he'll raise somebody up to do the job. So eventually somebody else would have had to step in and do what happened and what Peter eventually led into. And we see all uh, Peter's failure was not final. We see many failures in Scripture. I love the word of God because it shows the truth about life. It does not just show the beauty of life. It shows the good. It shows the bad. It shows the ugly. And it shows us how we can get up from the ugly. God did not just show us the beauty of the life of his people and where he wants to get us. He showed us their faults. He showed us their shortcomings. He showed us their failures so that we know that when it happens in my life, not if, but when it happens, I can get up from this. The question is, how do we get up? up I don't know about you but there have been times in my life where I know that I have failed God and the one question that I asked is how do I get up from here where do I go from this moment in life and I want to tell you don't waller in the mud don't continue to roll there and roll there sometimes you just have to get up and keep going I remember years ago when when the church called a fast I was very eager to fast, and I wanted to do something that showed God that I loved him. And I bit off more than I could chew because I decided to give up more than what I really knew that I could give up. And somewhere in the midst of that fast, I mistakenly eat something. I was standing at the stove cooking that night, and I, um, I think it was sweets. And y'all, I have a sweet tooth, if you cannot tell. But there was a piece of cake of some sort sitting by the stove as I was cooking. And I reached over before I knew. I picked it up and threw a piece in my mouth. And the devil immediately 
jumped on me. And what do we do? Nine times out of ten, we give up. I've done messed up. I can't finish the fast now. I've already broke the, the, the vow that I made. And we give up. And y'all, we cannot do that. Sometimes we just got to look at God and say, God, I'm human. You know I'm human. You created me. That's not an excuse for what happened. But I am sorry, and I ask you to forgive me. I forgive me and move on. Stop starting over on Monday because Monday never comes for some of us. I can't tell you how many times I've been going to start a diet on Monday and I get to next Friday and I still haven't started. And it's the same with our spiritual life. We're so, if I can just get to Sunday to praise God, I'll praise Him. And then we wake up with a headache and we just are so tired because we didn't sleep well last night. And we come in church and we don't praise Him like we were so ready to on last, last Tuesday. We have been so excited. I can't tell you sometimes how excited I am about being in the house of God on Sunday morning until Sunday morning. But sometimes we just got to come in and give a sacrifice of praise. That's the whole point of a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice is not comfortable. The whole essence of a sacrifice is something has to die. God, we see that throughout the entire scriptures and the way he laid out the Levitical law. This is not even part of my message, but let's go with it. He laid out the Levitical law, and it was all about the sacrificial lamb, the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And the only way that you can get the blood of the sacrificial lamb is it has to lay down its life. And I'm here to tell you that that lamb that laid down its life wasn't willing to do it. It was brought before the high priest. It was stood before them. They laid their hands upon him, confessed their sins, and then it was sacrificed against his will. It didn't tell them I'm okay with this, but Jesus, our sacrifice that shed his blood for us, he came down on this earth with full knowledge of knowing what he would have to do, and he knew how we would accept it, and he still did it anyway he knew and he had planned from the beginning of time that if I go down there and I live my life and I, I preach my ministry all for one soul that is enough for me to go for he even looked down over the, the years and down through the span of time and he called every one of us by name and he says, I'm doing this for this one. I'm doing this for that one. I'm doing it for him, for him, for her, for her, for this one, for that one. I'm doing it for all my children, no matter if they accept it or not. If but one and I almost am willing to bet you he if he knew not a single one of us down through the ages of time would have accepted his gift he still would have done it he was willing and he did just what he promised he would do now to my scripture Psalms 100 we're going to be in verses number one through five that's there's only five verses in there so come read along with me if you have it. Psalms chapter 100. A lot of us is, know this is a psalm of thanksgiving. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, I had to memorize these five verses. And we had a Thanksgiving pr uh, play of some sort at school. And we had to recite these five verses. I, to this day, cannot recite these verses. But... <laughs> Y'all forgive me. I am not one that can memorize scripture. I cannot memorize, even in, in my, my nursing knowledge, those books, I can't memorize that stuff. When I need to know something, I have to go back to it. And that's okay. Not everybody is the same. Not everybody's brain works the same. Because a lot of times I memorize the scripture, and when I try to recite it, I add something to it. So let's read it for what it says. Psalms chapter 100. The Bible says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All you lands, not some, all 
you lands. Verse number two, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And this is the verse of scripture I really want us to focus on tonight. Verse number four, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful for, to him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. Verse number four, one more time. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. Let's pray real quick. Our gracious Heavenly Father, God, I do thank you and I appreciate you for your love and your mercy, God. I, I am thankful for what you have already done here tonight, God. But, Lord, I'm asking you as you continue to move, as you continue to touch, that you would bless the word tonight, that you would bless me as I speak, God, that you would give me the ability to deliver to your people what you have given me to deliver, God. Lord, I ask you that you would just be with each and every one of us, God, that we would take just a moment to 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 search ourselves and break up any fallow ground that might be within us, that it would be prepared to receive the seed of the word of God that goes forth, that it can spring up new life in every one of us tonight. For it is in your son's precious and most holy name I pray. Amen and amen. Real quick, let's take a journey back to the Old Testament. Do you remember the layout of the Old Testament temple? There were three courts in the Old Testament temple. There was the outer court, there was the inner court, and there was the Holy of Holies. Now, anybody, any Jew, any Gentile, anybody else in the whole world was able to be on the outside, not the outer court, but on the outside of the temple itself. We see in the Gospels when Jesus is talking or when he goes into the, to the, um, to the temple and he turns over the tables and he runs the money changers out. We see what had begun to happen there is that some of the Jews were selling animals to the Gentiles outside of the gates that they would then take in and offer for, for the sacrifice of their sin because the Gentiles were not allowed to come into the court. It was for the Jews only. The Bible teaches us that the very first thing that you enter into the temple, there was only one entrance in. And it was the gates of praise. As the psalm says here, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Before you could ever get into the temple, you came in through the gates of praise. That will be pivotal here in just a few minutes. Once you entered into the gates of praise, anybody of Jewish descent was allowed within the outer court. Inside the outer court, you had the bronze altar and you had the, the brazing laver. Those two, th the, the outer court is all about laying down our sin, making sure we line up with the word of God. The very first thing we approach as we enter the gates of praise, the very next thing we see is the, the bronze altar. It is forever lit and that is where the sacrifices are laid down for our sins. There is another altar that's in the inner court, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But the outer court was all about laying down your trash, laying down your sin, laying down everything that separates you from God. You laid it on the altar. You made your sacrifice. When your sacrifice was made, you then proceeded to the brazing labor. When you looked in it, it was a big bowl. It was made. It had mirrors in it. And it was full of water, and you peered down in it, and in in essence, your reflection should line up with the reflection of God. When I look into the word of God, do I see my reflection or do I see his reflection? If I can peer into the brazing labor, so to speak, or I can peer into my life and all I see is me, there's a problem. Because I promise you, if all you see is you, then everybody around you sees you too. Nobody is going to see Christ in your life if you can't see him. 
the outer court is all about getting right, making sure my life lines up with Scripture, making sure there's nothing that stands between me and God before I enter into the inner court. Now, the thing about the inner court is any Jew could go in the outer court, but only the Levitical priest could enter the inner court. You had to be part of the tribe of Levi to enter into the inner court. Inside the inner court was the place where worship happened. So real quick, let me just fix something. Religion tells us there is a difference between religion and a relationship. If all you have is religion and all you have is the traditions of the church, you will find yourself in the pits of hell. Foot washing has a place. Communion has a place. Baptism has a place. But if that's all we got, we don't have Jesus. You have to have a relationship, a working relationship, not a weekly thing, a daily working relationship with Jesus Christ if you're going to make it to heaven. All of that happens, so to speak, for us today in the outer court. And I'm getting ahead of myself real quick. But I just want to let you know, for those of you, religion tells us that we have to get it right before we praise God. If you walk through the outline of the Old Testament temple, you praised him first. Then you came in and got it right. You don't have to be right with him to praise him. Just to let you know. Now, when you get right with him, there ought to be more praise. There ought to be deeper praise. And I'm not saying just to come in and pray. Don't stop at the gate. If you're going to do enough to enter into the gate, let's do it all. The whole point of walking through the Old Testament temple, and we, it, it, our churches should be lined up with that today some, to, a sort of, to a sort of aspect. We ought to walk, approach God. There is a protocol to how we approach God. And the church has got it backwards. We've got this flippant idea that we can just walk into the back doors of the church, sit on the pew, rest beside J.C., and have a great day. And I'm going to tell you one thing. If that's how you approach him, he is as far away from you as he possibly can be. You do not approach royalty flippantly. I love democracy. I love our government, not the government that we have today, but the fact that we have democracy in America and that we have a voice for what happens. There is no democracy in heaven. We don't have a voice for what happens. And the fact that we live under that I believe has given us the, a, a backwards idea of how we approach God. There is a protocol, and the Old Testament temple was the protocol to approaching God. The whole point of walking through the Old Testament temple was to get to the pivotal place, which was the Holy of Holies, which is where his presence is. We're walking through the inner court. Like I said, the Levitical priests were the only ones that were allowed into the, into the inner court. In the inner court is where they worship God. We see the, the um, table of showbread that was there. We see the golden lampstands that were full of oil and that burned. And the commandment of God was that they were to burn and never burn out. They were to be filled with oil twice a day. That way they never burn out. And then we see the altar of incense. The altar of incense is a different type of prayer there because now in the outer court, we've already taken care of our sin. We've already laid down the stuff that has so easily beset us. We've already got rid of the dirt. We've washed ourselves in the, 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 the brazing labor. We've washed our hands, our feet. We've made sure that we line up with the word of God. Then we enter into the 
the inner court where we begin to worship. We worship him through the, the table of showbread there. The understanding of what showbread was, it was bread that was um, cooked every day. And it was on that altar or on the table there for 24 hours. But miraculously, it stayed hot all day long. It stayed hot and it stayed fresh all day long. But it was to be eaten and baked fresh the next morning. It was eaten by the priest. But it was their way of saying, I'm thankful. It was a gift from the priest back to God, even though they did eat it. It was their gift back to him for being their provider. We see that in our church today as we give our offerings unto God. We then pass the, the table of showbread. We see the, the golden lamp stands there. And like I told you a few minutes ago, the commandment of a God was that the fire was to burn eternally on the golden lamp stand. It was to never burn out. The golden lamp stand is the same as what we see in the, in the, um, around the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, what we know as the menorah. It was the same. That's where it comes from. It had... Um, Seven different lights on it from, um, from Scripture. And it burned all the time. When his light, that represents the light of Christ, when his light came into us, it was never meant to burn out. Now, I understand us as humans, they are, uh, the Bible says that he's married to the backslider. We don't all stay into, and, and, I, and I don't subscribe to a gospel that preaches um, that once saved, always saved. I believe if you get saved and stay saved, then you are once saved, always saved. But I just know the life that I have lived. I've gotten saved. I tell people about 792 times in my life. When I was a teenager, I got saved every Easter, every Mother's Day, every Christmas play. Every time the church come together, I was in the altar. Finally, one day it did stick, and I thank God for it. But none of us sitting under the, I can't say none of us, I can speak for me, but I can almost say that none of us sitting under the sound of my voice today has gotten saved, and the light of Christ has burned without being hampered of some sort in our life. I know that I have fallen short of the glory many times, and I know that I have had to go back and let him reignite that light in me. I hate to admit it, but I'm not ashamed of it because it's brought me closer to him. I'm not going to stand up here and make you think that I got saved at the age of 14 years old, which I did get saved at 14 and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost all in one year. I didn't stay there. I hate to admit that, but it happened. The golden lampstand represented the light of Christ. The oil that burns and it represents the Holy Ghost. It is an eternal flowing oil that keeps the light burning in our life. And it was to never burn out. It was to never be dampered. We progress past that. And the next thing we see is the altar of incense. And this is the altar when the Bible talks about the prayers of the saints bottled up for us. This is that altar where those prayers are given. The altar of incense. We pray the prayers that lines us up as the pastor was talking this morning. And he so eloquently put it, the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. This is where we find the heart knowledge of God. This is where we move past knowing of him and knowing him. I know many people because I've seen every celebrity I've ever seen on TV. I know them. I can Google their name and find out personal information. And I have talked to people who has never met certain people in their life, but they can tell you who they are, where they've been, like they live inside their house. And have never laid eyes on them, have never even got in their presence, never even been in the same state as they have been in the past. Can you do that about God? Do you have such a knowledge of God, not a head knowledge of knowing him, but or knowing who he is, but knowing him, that intimate relationship where you can tell people who he is, what he's done, as if you have been in the same room with him all your life. 
There's a difference in having a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. And I find something very interesting, just a medical fact to point out to you guys. There is one nerve that connects the heart to the brain. When we do a heart transplant, we have to sever that nerve. But when I put a new heart in your chest, I cannot reconnect that attachment. And the heart works all on its own. Why do you think we preach a message of the heart, the transplanting of the heart when Jesus comes in? He changes everything because there's a point where he severs that connection to the brain so we can separate the head knowledge from the heart knowledge. Get him out of here. Get him here. The song we sang just a couple weeks ago, and I believe it might have been last week, Jesus at the center of it all. I preached this the last time that I preached here. That God cannot be just number one in your life because when he's number one, you can replace him and he can become number two. He can become number three. Not willingly, but it happens. I get up every morning with the intentions of following my agenda. But by the end of the day, I can look back at my agenda that I intended to follow. I didn't follow it like I wrote it out. But when he's at the center of everything, nothing happens that does not revolve around him. Everything revolves around him. Once we get past that last altar in there, there was one more court in, the, in, the, in the, um, the temple, and that was the Holy of Holies. This was the one room, and only one individual had the privilege of going in there, and it was the high priest. He did not just flippantly walk in to the Holy of Holies because the Bible tells us that when he walked into the Holy of Holies, along the edge of his garment, God commanded bells to be sewn around the edge of their garment or the, the, the hem of their garment. As long as they heard the bells ringing, they knew that he was still alive. But the Bible says before he entered in, not only did he have the bells, but they tied a rope around his foot so that in the event that the bells quit ringing, they would drag him out because nobody but the high priest was able to enter into the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies housed the Ark of the Covenant. And as we know the Ark of the Covenant, it was the throne in which the presence of God himself descended once a year and sat. In the presence of a man as he made sacrifices for the people of Israel. They didn't even have the ability to go before God themselves and ask for forgiveness. They had to let another man do it for them. And if for some reason he did something stupid the night before he entered in and he messed up, he would be dragged out. And could not finish what he went in to do. Do you see the depth of that position? Now the interesting thing about the, the Levites and those who... who um, the service in the inner court as well as the Holy of Holies. They cast lots on who performed the service. So you may have been a Levite, and you may have been part of the royal priesthood, but the fact that you may have only been able to do the job you were called to do one time in your entire life, depending on how the lot fell, you may have never got to serve in that position. Do you know how that would feel if you walked into the church doors? And they gave you a position in the church, but they told you every Sunday when we walk in, we're going to cast lots. You may or you may not serve that day. And you can hold that position for 50 years of your life, and you may have only served in that position one time. Do you see how getting so comfortable with God has made us view this so backwards 
and has made us view him as our best friend, our buddy whom we just hang out with on Friday nights. We have lost what it means. We have lost the protocol of approaching God. And we ask ourselves, where has he gone? Why do we no longer see the movement of him in our service? Why do we no longer feel what we used to feel? And it's because we have broken protocol. Now, I am so thankful because in the Old Testament temple, not near one of us that's sitting under the sound of my voice would have ever been able to experience what it was like to even get in the temple, much less get in the presence of God. The Gentiles of that day and the many Jews that were not part of the Levites and those that never served in the role of high priest never got in his presence. Could you imagine serving God that we know today and never being able to get in his presence? But the Bible tells us that when Jesus was crucified, just before he died, the Bible says that the, the darkness fell upon the land. There was a great earthquake. And inside the temple, the veil that separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies, it was torn in two. Now, the interesting thing about it, and I know we talked about this and you've probably heard it before, it was torn from top to bottom. And that speaks to us to let us know that no man could have ever done that. It was God himself that reached down and he took that veil and he tore it in two. In essence, to separate because when Jesus gave his life for all mankind, when Jesus gave his life for every person of every creed, of every tongue, of every race, of every nationality, of every other religion. He made a way for all men to enter into the holy of holies. We have gotten so dem democratic wise of approaching God like we have a say so in the way that we're going to praise him. Like we have a say so in the way that we're going to worship him. And in fact, if you read your Bible, you will understand that we are commanded to worship him. We are commanded to praise him. The whole title of my message tonight is praise is the key because without it, you never got into the temple at all. Praise is our key to get into the door. Praise is our key to even begin the process of getting to God. When you think of, of, of the royalty and the royal monarch, just thinking of the king of England, you don't just walk in off the street in Buckingham Palace and approach his throne because you probably going to get shot if you even get to the palace line. And yet we bust through those back doors every Sunday morning after who knows what we did on Saturday night. And we walk in here thinking God's going to answer our prayer. And we've never done anything throughout the week to even approach him. I made a statement this morning and I'm sure you've heard it before. It is private worship that breeds our public praise. If you don't have a private worship time at home, I can promise you your praise is as fraudulent as it can be on Sunday morning. If you don't have that private time with God, there's no way you can have true praise. Praise and worship, they go hand in hand. We can have praise without worship, but we cannot have true praise without worship. Our praise is the key to getting in the door. It is the key that begins the process of the protocol to even get to God. It is time for us as a church to begin to approach God in the way that he has told us to approach him. If we will come unto him the way he has told us to come unto him, I can promise you, you'll be welcomed in every single time. 
But if you just enter in nonchalantly, you come in not caring what what's went on in your life. You try to bypass the steps because even though the veil was rent and we no longer walk through the, the same structure of the Old Testament temple, our church structure and our worship life still should line up the same way. We begin with praise to get into the gate. Once we get in the gate, we then have to deal with the sin in our life, the dirt in our life. The interesting thing was when they entered in, they had to take their shoes off. Because they would have to bathe their feet. They would have to wash their hands. And I heard a preacher preach one time when Moses was um, at the burning bush. God said, take your shoes off, Moses. What did it matter if he had shoes on or not? It was a form of surrender. Because he asked me to is enough. But it was a form of surrender. But then he added that little part on the end that we forget about a lot because you're on holy ground. When God descended into that burning bush, his presence was all around. And when Moses took his shoes off, in essence, when he stepped on holy ground, he was then connected to the very presence of God. Now, am I saying we got to walk in the back door and take our shoes off? No, because I don't want to smell some of your feet. I don't want to smell my own sometimes. But there are some times that the presence just gets so heavy in here that I feel God say, take your shoes off. Just to connect because he's in everything. His presence has entered the building and it has made this hollow, holy ground. We're no longer just standing on wood and concrete, but we're standing and connecting with the very presence of God. There's something different about it. If you've never done it, try it. I promise it's radical. It'll change the way you see him. It'll change the way you approach him. We have got to get back to approaching him in the way he has lined it up for us to approach him. Come through praise. If you don't know this, there are... Eight different types of praise in the scripture. I have grown up all my life in the Pentecostal church. I have heard many people say, I'm uncomfortable raising my hands. I'm uncomfortable shouting. I'm uncomfortable clapping. I'm uncom- Because that's just not me. I'm a quiet person and I don't feel like having an outward praise. And nine times out of ten, I would say and I'm willing to say that that is just an excuse that we use not to do it. I love working with teenagers. I love watching children worship because their worship is raw. They could care less what you think about them praising God, and they go all in. If they want to jump, they jump. If they want to run, they run. If they want to scream, they scream, and they just give God their all, and they don't care what none of us think. The older we get, we get to the point where we begin to wonder, what is the person sitting next to me thinking about? But if I run the aisles, somebody's just going to talk about me. So what? Let them talk. They're going to talk about you anyhow. Let them talk. It'll give them a conversation over dinner because they're not talking about Scripture. Give them something to talk about. At least they're talking about the movement of God. They might keep from gossiping because they're talking about the movement of God. What does it matter if someone talks about you later on? What does it matter if you look crazy? What does it matter if your makeup runs down your face or your hairpins fall out of your hair? I can remember growing up seeing hairpins fly every side of the church. I have seen the movement of God. I was blessed to come in under that, not, I don't want to say the last way because I believe it's coming back. But that wave of the Spirit where people truly went in after God no matter what. They didn't come to church to be pumped up. They came to church with a praise in their heart. They had already seasoned their life. They had already been before God through the inner or the outer court. And they have already made themselves clean or allowed Him to make them clean. They've they've got the dirt off of them. They've lined their life up with Scripture. They entered the back door of the church ready to worship. 
We walk through the back door of the church today, and we sit down, and it's like, I'm going to see if the pastor can move me today with his message. Maybe the praise team might sing my favorite song. Maybe they don't. And if we don't sing your favorite song, nine times out of ten, you sit down, and you don't even hear what the pastor says because you're still fuming over the fact that we didn't sing your favorite song. And the only thing you have done is tied a knot in the ability for God to move in you. God is all powerful. He is almighty. But do you know I, as a human, have the ability to tie his hands behind his back and stop him from ever working in my life? He is above all powerful. He is above all knowing. He is above all presence. There is nothing he can't do, but I can stop him from ever working in my life as a mere human. And so often we do that. It is time for us to get back to the true protocol of approaching God. Understanding there is no democracy in heaven. It is all a monarchy. It is all reverent to who he is, to what he says, and what he wants. He could care less if you're ashamed to run the aisles. He could care less if you feel ashamed that your hairpins fall out when his spirit moves upon you. Now, I do know that scripture teaches us that God is a gentleman and he will not force himself upon us. He won't. That's what I mean by we can tie his hands. But rest assured, if you unlock the door for him to walk in, there ain't no telling what you gonna do. You might have been the quietest person in your life. I remember growing up in church, there was a dear old saint in, in the house of God, probably 70-ish years old. You did not hear a word out of her. She would always sit over there. She quietly praised. You could see her lift her hands, but you never heard a word out of her. But every now and then, the spirit would move in that church. And that dear old sister would jump up out of her pew and her mouth would fly open and the most beautiful heavenly language would come out of her mouth. And God would issue a word to the saint through her. But you never heard anything out of her. We had a 90 year old woman in the church that I grew up in. She couldn't. There was three steps outside of our church that she had to have help getting up. But you let the Holy Ghost get all over her and she could dance around the aisles of the church. Never one time hitting a pew and never one time needing somebody to assist her. I told a story of growing up in the church. Not um, I was a couple Sundays ago. Y'all, we had the most amazing conversation about this. This is where I got my message from. This gentleman came uh, with a group that sung at the church, and he, he was blind. And when I say blind, I'm not talking about he just can't see five feet in front of him. I'm literally, he was blind and could not see anything. Had been blind from birth, but he could play. The, it was either the guitar or the bass. I can't remember which one, but could play it so beautifully. And that boy took off running in the church one day. And it had to be the power of God because he got inches away from, we had doors on the side of the church, kind of like this on the stage, ran around the back of the church, got inches away from the door, and I thought he was going to bust right through it. And before he ever touched it, turned around and went back the other way. Tell me, God does not move in his people. God will make you do some things you never thought possible. I can remember one night I was up here singing, and I took, if I jumped off this stage right now, I would hurt myself. But I've sailed off this stage and run around this church before under the power of God, and I'm not talking about me, but the power of God is so real, and it is still so real, and he still wants to let it loose in his church. But we have got to approach him in the right manner. We have got to quit coming in the house just nonchalantly thinking he's going to move because he's not going to. We got to get over the fact that we want to be out of church by 12 because we got to make it down to the, to the um, restaurant before the other churches get down there so we can get our favorite seat, so we can get our favorite waiter, so we can get our food first, so we can get out. 
I promise you, if you come in this church and you tell God, if you don't move by 12, I'm gone. You will leave before you see him move. He does not operate on our timetable. He will not operate under our commandment. He will not operate under what we tell him to do. It is the other way around. And the moment that we begin to start commanding God to do stuff, we are borderlining witchcraft. You don't command God. I don't command God. I'm very careful even when I've heard preachers preach that message that when God has promised you something, it's okay to command it from. I ain't testing God. I'll remind him of what he's saying, but I'll add it. And if, if you're ready to do it, I'm ready to receive it. You know, kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm not testing God, y'all. But there are in the scripture, if you read throughout the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is all about praise. It's all about praise. Most of the book of Psalms is written by David. It's written during a time of his life that is not good. He's you either just, you know, committed adultery and he's lost his child and he's on the 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 out out source of God. And, and he's trying to get back in the presence of God. If anybody failed in scripture, it was David. But David was called a man after God's own heart because he knew what praise could do. If you look throughout the entire scriptures of, of the book of Psalms, you can find over and over and over and over again. And I'm here to ease your mind. Those of you who don't like to shout, those of you who don't like to lift your hands or, or make loud noise, there is a praise for you. You know the old saying about the cell phone, there's an app for that. There's a praise for that. We see throughout Scripture and throughout the book of Psalms, many, many times we see a Yoda praise. It is the extending of the hands to express gratitude, to express thankfulness, and to express surrender. A Yoda praise is what we give God to show our thankfulness to Him. The next one is a Toda praise. It is another one where we lift up our hands, but instead of lifting up our hands to express gratitude and thankfulness, it is an expression of thanksgiving specifically for what has not occurred yet in our life. So a Yoda praise, you may see your your neighbor sitting next to you with their hands lifted up, they may be expressing thanksgiving for what has happened and what God has done for them, giving him a Yoda praise while you're sitting there giving him a Toda praise because I'm praising him for what I'm asking him for. Do you know there's power in going to God in prayer and forgetting about I need, I need, I need and going to him saying, God, I thank you that you have already met my need. I don't know when it's going to come through. I don't know when you're going to meet it, but I know it's already met. You've already made provision. It's coming down the pipeline, and I thank you for it. I've told this many, many times before. The last church that we were at, the pastor every year, just like our pastor does, gets up before the church, and he says, 90 days, pay your tithes religiously, pay them right, and see that you are not more blessed at the end of the 90 days than you were at the beginning of the 90 days. And if you are not, the church will write you a check back for every dollar that you've paid over the 90 days. I don't know if our pastor says that, but this one did. And I was like, I pay my tithes religiously, and I know how God blesses because I have seen him do it. I have been in times where I had to make the decision whether I was going to pay my tithes or pay my bill, and I decided to pay my tithes, and somehow the bill got paid. I don't know how it did, but some, I do know how it did because he did it. But I asked him, I said, what can I do to challenge you to prove yourself to me once again? Not that I need it, but what can I do? And he said, for 90 days, don't you ask me for a single thing. Don't ask me for anything. I learned, in that 90 days, I learned a new way to pray because it got... Way, way, way away from all that. God, I need. God, this is what I need you to do. This is what I want you to do. I, I, I need this. I need that. I need, I need, I need. And I learned to pray and praise. 
And I begin to see things happen in my life that I have been praying for and telling him I need it for years because I've changed the way I approached him. There is a Barak praise. The Barak praise, or those, for those of you who are quiet individuals, this means to kneel or to bow down before God, to express humility and reverence. There's no noise to it whatsoever. You just simply bow down. You simply give honor and give reverence to God. Every time you, in, in, um, in the monarchy of England, any time the king or the queen of the days walks in the room, everybody bows their head. It is a sign of reverence and it is a sign saying that they, we are beneath you and we reverence you. The Barak praise is essential to kneel before God, to express our humility, our humanity, to express reverence for who he is and a fear, a reverent fear before God. There is a Tehillah praise. A Tehillah praise is a, a song of praise. I love to sing. I will tell you real quick, fast, and in a hurry, if you want to get some movement and the spirit out of me, give me a song. Because I can approach God more through music than I can sometimes through prayer. I love music. I'll get out on the lawnmower sometimes, pop my earbuds in, and I'll listen to music, and I get lost in what I'm doing because I get in this mode of praise. A Tehillah praise, it is a song of praise, but it's not only just a song of praise like the praise team ushers us into every Sunday, but it also can be a song of scripture to edify the church, to teach. And that's what we do because the songs that we sing is based off of the scripture. It's helping us understand the word of God. And if we will quit just singing words to check off a box and we will actually sing them with the spirit of gladness in us and a spirit of thanksgiving, it is a praise unto God that he can move in. I remind us of the scripture that says that God inhabits the praises of his people. When we make an atmosphere of praise, he can then descend and live in that atmosphere. It's all about praise. There is a Zamar praise, and a Zamar praise is very specific. That's Zamar, Z-A-M-A-R. It is on the stringed instruments or on the instruments of the church. It is by music, and we see David was very big in the Zamar praise because he praised on the instruments. There was music throughout all of David's um, kingship of Israel, and it was a praise. But the one rule of a Zamar praise, it is to be a song of of joy, not a song of lament, not a song of sorrow. The only way you can offer God is the more praises through the instruments with a song of joy. There is a taqwa praise, which is the clapping of the hands. Uh, Psalms 43 tells us, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Anybody can clap their hands. It's not that hard. We can clap them in in worship, we can clap them in uh, the music. We can clap them whenever. The last two praises that I want to mention tonight, there is the Shabbat praise and there is the Halil praise. The Shabbat praise is a loud shout of praise. It's not that little, thank you, Jesus, I praise you. It is a loud, boisterous shout of praise. And I know there's a lot of us that sit in here that says, I just can't shout in church. I just can't raise my voice in church. But go down to your favorite sports team, and I promise you'll be hollering on the stands. Let your youngin act up in the house, and you'll show them just how loud you can get. If we can bring the energy of how we yell at some people, and just shout with a shabak of praise to God. There was a study done about, um, about shouting. When the human voice shouts, it literally sheds the atmosphere. When we issue a shout from our lungs, it rips the atmosphere that is around us. Interestingly enough, what does the scripture tell us Satan is the ruler over? This world, but he's the ruler of the air. 
He sits above us. So when we shout, in essence, what we're doing, when we offer that Shabbat praise, that loud shout of praise, we literally shred the kingdom that is between us and God. We shred the atmosphere, and it allows our praise to then get through. And the last one is the Halil praise. It is the root word that we get hallelujah from. The Halil praise is one, it's, it's almost a mix of all the other ones that I have mentioned. We see it many times in the church. We've seen it a lot in David. The Halil praise is an extravagant and praise. It's not just a little movement. It's not just the clapping of the hands. It's not just the shout of praise. It is all of them mixed in one. And it is where we get that root word for hallelujah. We sing a song in the church to give God the highest praise. What is the highest praise? It is hallelujah. Hallelujah is the one word that is the same in every language. It doesn't change. It is the ultimate praise that we can give to God. A halil praise, the extravagant praise, the mix of all other praise, the, sh- the, the, the lifting of the hands, the praising him for what has happened and praising him for what has not yet happened. The, the song of praise, the praise of kneeling down. You can do all of that in the halil praise. Pick your praise and get to work. It is time that we get back to praise because that is the only key that is going to unlock the door to even begin the protocol for us to approach God where he's at. You do not have to be saved to praise him. You, If you come in the church on Sunday morning and you decided to go out and, and party and, and live it up on Saturday night, you don't have to make it right before you praise him. Go ahead and enter the gates of praise. That is your key to get in before you can begin to even work on your soul salvation with him. There is an atmosphere of praise that has to be started first. Praise is so important to us because it unlocks the gate. Somebody will come on to the piano tonight. Our approach to God has got to begin with praise. When we praise him, it peels back everything that is before us. There's a song that I heard several years ago, and it talks about praise, and I honestly can't remember all the words, but the gist of it was, when we praise, the doors to heaven open. The Father is moved by our praise, and at that moment in the praise, all of heaven stands still so that he can hear Not that he needs it quiet, but so that heaven can hear what the saints have need of. Our praise creates an atmosphere, and Scripture tells us, and I mentioned it a minute ago, that God inhabits the praises of his people. That word inhabit literally means to live in. When you inhabit your home, you move in. When you go to a motel, you don't inhabit a motel. When you rent an Airbnb for a weekend vacation, you don't inhabit that Airbnb. You just stay there. If you go to stay the night at a friend's house, you don't inhabit that place. But when you go home, you have keys that unlock your door. I have mine in my pocket right here. When I walk up to your door, these keys won't do a single thing for me. But when I walk up to the door of my house, I put that key in the lock, I turn it, and I inhabit my home. I dwell there. I live there. My praise is the key that I give to him. To unlock the
the way to approach him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. When we get to the point that we do that at church again, he'll show up again. Because we've taken the praise. In essence, we've taken the keys. And he cannot inhabit the atmosphere. We tied his hands to entering his own house. We've tied his hands of entering his own creation. And when I say his house, his church, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about this. The Bible says this is the temple of God. It was bought with a price. And that price was his shed blood, his life. There is no force in this earth other than an American soldier and God himself that has given his life for us. And even the American soldiers that fought our freedom compare nothing to what God has done for us. Because he bought me when I was trash. I don't know about you, but my sin was not pretty. My life before Christ was not pretty. Right now, if God was to flash a display of everything up here, of what my life outside of him has been, I would be utterly ashamed and would never want to show my face in this church ever again. And he still bought me. He bought me knowing that in essence I was a harlot going after other gods. That I was more in love with the world than I was with him. That I wanted more of what Satan had to offer than what he did. And if we were to all tell the truth, that's our story too. And he bought us. I love the story of Jose and Goma. Because he didn't do it just one time. The Bible says he told her to go down and marry a woman of harlotry. And he married her and she left him for what she used to know. And he went back and he bought her again. And it says she did it again. And he went back and he bought her again. And y'all, I want to tell you, that is what God does for us. He bought us with a price. Every time we sin. We make him relive what he went through on Calvary. Not a physical thing, but every time I sin and I have to go to him and ask him for forgiveness, in his mind he knows what he did to buy me. You cannot make me think that Jesus was able to forget that. What he went through, what he felt, them plucking the beard out of his face, beating him with the cat of nine tails, taking those 39 stripes on his back. And if you take 39 stripes and you multiply it by that cat of nine tails, I can't do math, but 39 times nine is a lot. The Bible says when they were finished with him and hung him on the cross that they did not even know he was a man. And he did that knowing who we were and in hopes that we would accept the gift that he gave us. Pick your praise. Do you want to give him a Yoda praise? Do you want to give him a Toda praise? Do you want to give him a Barak praise and just kneel down and reverence him? Are you okay with giving him a Tehila praise and actually singing to him and letting him know who he is to you? Are you able to play an instrument and able to give him a Zamar praise, a praise of joy and adoration? 
can you give him a taqwa praise and just clap your hands to let him know, God, you are good. You are my father. You have done so much for me. And even if you don't do anything else for me, I'm still going to praise you. Are you willing to give him a Shabbat praise and shout until you can't shout anymore? I love the song. We, we sang it last week too. It's, it's his breath that is in my lungs. And with that breath, are we willing to shout our praises unto him to let him know how important he is to us, to let him know that we recognize the gift that he gave us, to let him know that I am sold out 100% undeniably for you and I'll never turn back. Are you willing to mix it all together and give him that hallelujah praise? Dance before the Lord. The Bible says that David danced before God. I love watching children dance before God. When it's done right, I love to see the, the praise dancers that have the flags in church. And I have seen some people that just do it and it wasn't done right. And it was more of a distraction in the house than it was a praise. But when it's done right, we have got to break out of the box that we have built for our church. Because there are more types of praise than just saying hallelujah, than just clapping our hands, than just saying I praise you. We can praise him every Sunday by giving in the tithes and the offer him. Our life should be a living praise to him. The words that come out of our mouth should be so seasoned with him that they praise him. The actions that we do should praise him. When we have entered the gates with praise, we've unlocked the door to approaching God. We go to the bronze altar. We lay down our sin. And in essence of saying, God, I love you more than this and I'm tired of what it's doing in my life. Do you know there are some things that's in your life that's a sin for you that may not be a sin for the person that's sitting next to you? Those, those personal convictions of God. And there are those times in your life that something you do, something you enjoy, is not a sin. But sometimes you look at him and say, I love you more than I love this and I'm willing to lay it down for you. And you offer that sacrifice to him. Not that he asks for it. But you want it to show him just how much you love him. Are you willing to get out of your aisle sometimes on Sunday morning when you have prayed and you have asked God and you have sought Him for things for years? Are you willing to get out of your aisle and dance before God just to get His attention? When I take my keys out and I shake them, it gets the attention of whoever I'm shaking them. If I want one of my boys to unlock the door because I'm coming with groceries, I shake my keys at them and I throw them to them so they'll unlock the door. Sometimes God is waiting on us to praise Him in a way that it gets His attention. Not that He's not paying attention to us, because He is. He knows everything that's going on every moment of your life. He knows it from the beginning to the end. He don't need us to get his attention. But sometimes we got to take our praise and shake the keys and say, God, I'm here. God, I need you. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get to you. If it means rolling on the floor, if it means shouting to the top of my lungs, if it means that my mascara is going to run down my face, if it means that my hair is going to look a mess when I get out of here, if it means that I'm going to sweat to the point that I stink and I have to go home and take a shower before I come back tonight, I don't care. I just want you your attention pay attention to me God see me that begins the protocol to approaching God and I know that it sounds like a long process to get to him but sometimes it's just like that 
Because what I love about God is when we take the first step, He'll meet us where we're at. If I will begin to just praise Him, Sometimes in my praise, I take care of several of those steps. And sometimes just through my praise, I'm able to get through the outer court, into the inner court, and right into the presence of God. Other times, I have to work for it. And there are times that God is just so gracious that He just comes down and He says, Here I am, do you want me? God has literally spoken through the mouth of our pastor these last couple weeks and has told the church, I am standing before you to do what I have promised you that I will do. All I need you to do is want it. And all we got to do is praise him. There's a beautiful song that I heard. And one line in it simply says, I never lost my praise. It's a beautiful song. And I was asked one time if I could learn that song to sing it. And I'm sad to say that I can't because I would be singing a lie. Because there have been times in my life that I lost my praise. All of you sitting here to know, know the last four and a half years of my life, and I have been told time and time again through prophetic word, through prophetic word, when you get back to your praise, the doors will open. And I've asked God, what more can I do? What more do I need to do? to give up how what I mean what do I need to do because I can't seem to get there and y'all this message wrecked me because sometimes it's not about what you can give up sometimes it's not about what you can do sometimes all you have to do is throw your hands up begin to cry out unto God grab his attention and he will meet you where you are God is wanting to blow this church off of the very foundation that it is sitting on. But he cannot do it until he can get us back to approaching him in a biblical manner. We cannot approach him as our best friend because he is not. We cannot approach him as our child because that he definitely is not. We cannot approach him as we approach our manager at work. The only way to approach him is in reverence, is in fear, with our heads down in an attitude of praise. song that the praise team is learning to sing talks about gratitude and I wish I had the words with me but I'll, the course of it literally says it, it says so I'll throw up my hands and I'll praise you again and again well, what's the other part of it Because all that I have, I'm sorry. So I'll throw, that, I'll throw up my hands and I'll praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it goes on to say, I know it's not much. But I have nothing else left. Than a heart. Or nothing else fit for a king than a heart singing. Hallelujah. Y'all, when we get past our mad spell with God, 
when we get past our pity party, when we get past our upset that he didn't answer our prayer the way that we asked him to or the way that we thought that he should, when we get over him telling us no and we get back to an attitude of gratitude and we begin to approach him through the protocol that he has laid down for us, he will throw open those gates and welcome you into his presence That is where he will show up again. I started out tonight with a question. What's changed? It hasn't been him. Scripture teaches us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. We moved. We got complacent. We approached him through the democratic lines of democracy. We began to tell him how we were going to praise him. We began to put time limits on God. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with order of service, but we have written orders of services and we expect him to fall within the guidelines of those orders. Now, I thank God that we live, that we are a part of a church that is willing to take them orders and throw them right out the window and let God move as freely as he wants to. We have it simply for a guideline. That way, if we have to, that's how we are, because the Bible says he does things in decency and in order. We cannot come in that back door and just throw together a praise party and think God's going to move in it. We must approach Him in spirit and in truth and in order and in the way that He said we'll approach Him. And if we'll do that, there's nothing that you have prayed for. There's nothing that you have asked for. There's no promise that God has made you that he will not answer. If you leave this earth tomorrow with unanswered prayers, it is your own fault. It's your own fault. It's my own fault. Because he has said, he has said himself through the mouth of our shepherd in this church, I am here to do what I have promised you I will do. If we will approach him in the way he wants us to approach him. Tonight I just want us to close in prayer. If you'll stand with me. Usually I just turn it over to the pastor, but... He, he hasn't made it yet, so I guess I got to handle this part of the service. And if we will come together tonight, Miss um, Patricia wants us to anoint and pray over Nasir for his eye. The Bible tells us that if we're in need of something, it says to call to the saints of the church. Let them anoint you with oil. Let them pray the prayers. The Bible says God will answer. But tonight, let's do things a little bit different. Let's approach him the way he wants us to approach him. Let's walk in that kingdom protocol. And let's watch him touch this baby. And if anybody else needs prayer, we'll pray for you as well tonight. But take a moment as we approach him to do it in praise. Let's watch God move.